couple of weeks ago, and it was with Kiefer Sutherland. No way. Serious? Yes. So he said, no media. No media. So I'd already reviewed his Red Bank whiskey in August. It was in my September issue, so I had to have done it in August. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Invited, and I went. And everybody was, like, all over him. And when it was my turn, I sort of said, I know you said no media, Kiefer, but, you know, I already reviewed your whiskey. Here's the magazine from September with it in. And then there was no reason to talk about whiskey. So I said to him, um, you know, I and I don't know anything really about him. I know more about his dad. And yeah, everybody, yeah, yeah. everybody else was all about his granddad, who I certainly didn't know anything about. Tommy Douglas, who gave... Yeah. The health system to Canada, which is not my from Weyburn, Saskatchewan, and there's a statue there. I mean, this is all you know, but then I said, I believe you're in a band, and he said, Oh, yeah, and then he said, Where are you from? So I said, Nowhere posh, just Manchester. And then we start talking about him playing in Manchester, and in England, I was on the periphery of the music scene for 16 years. I was with people like Tom Petty and Shut up. <laughs> And then Glenn Fry and Pete Townsend and Paul McCartney and George. Anybody who played a Rickenbacker was. Linda, you've met Paul McCartney. <laughs> yes. I'm not kidding. Have you met Paul McCartney? Yes, he played Rickenbackers. And we did all the artist liaison in Europe for Rickenbacker. So anybody who came, like, could you just, you know, we would get those faxes from Rickenbacker who are in Santa Ana in California. Could you be in Amsterdam on Friday? John Kay from Steppenwolf's rehearsing. I'm sending you a guitar. Can you take it to him? I'm there. <laughs> Go and interview him and talk to him. And that was my life for 16 years. It was fantastic. So when I was talking to Kiefer and we're talking about music and I mentioned that, and he's going like, Linda, when I'm in Calgary next time, have you got a card I'd like to take you for dinner? And uh, let's talk music. <laughs> you, you, I want to hear about the people you met. <laughs> And everybody was like, how did the oldest person in the room get that invite? Kidding me? <laughs> so crazy. It's <laughs> even cooler than I thought. <laughs> oh, I've got a lot of stories. I but... can imagine. Are you kidding me? Lemmy from Motorhead was one of our closest friends. Because he only lived Lemmy? Half down Lemmy? the road. Yeah. Yeah, Lemmy. I know. We gave Are him a you gift. He cried when we gave him his base. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I have a lot of stories. <laughs> all of them good and all of them funny. Hilarious so, ones. So, so, so you did meet Paul McCartney? You've met Paul McCartney? I dealt more with his manager, Johnny Hamill, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Paul. Um, Paul tends to be elusive. And while Linda was alive, even more so. But no, but certainly. And George Harrison. While he was alive, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I followed a villain tour around for six weeks. We oh, had no, Bowie, Bowie. I'm going Bowie, Bowie. <laughs> no, Bowie didn't play a Rickenbacker. No, we did a Dylan tour, not because Dylan plays a Rickenbacker, but okay. because he was supported by Tom Petty, who does, who did, and the Heartbreakers, who did, yeah. and he was supported by Roger McGuinn from the Birds, who definitely plays a twelve-string Rickenbacker. So we spent six weeks with that lot. So you, so you got to like hang out with Tom Petty. Yes. Unbelievable. You know, <laughs> you, good. I'm so glad we're recording this because this is gonna stay. <laughs> this Tom, is crazy. Tom Petty was like, when he arrived, he said, Linda, do you think you could get onto Pete Townsend and ask if I could go and see him and arrange an appointment for me? And I went, you know, Tom, I could, but I strongly recommend you do it yourself. I can give you his number, his personal number, if you like. I think, oh, no, Linda, no, you, could you do it? Tom, I'm warning you, I'll do it while you're standing here, and I'll let you hear what he says. Are you serious? Like, this is how they talk? Yes, so I call, and Pete's like, hey, Linda, how are you doing? I'm great. Um, I've just got Tom Petty with me here, and he wants to know if you two can get together. And he goes, tell me to fucking ring me himself and puts the phone down. Tom, I no way. What's going to happen? I know the man. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> well, did they ever talk about? Did they ever talk about eating out, like in restaurants, with you, or? Um, not too too much. I must admit. Okay. Food was not a big part of their lives. Drink, yes. Food, not so much. Right. Okay. You know, well, we, we talked a lot about drink. 
Well, it's funny because when I was thinking about doing this podcast around, you know, musicians and food, I actually stumbled across Paul McCartney talking. This was asking with Paul McCartney. Paul McCartney was explaining his love of like, I think, banana sandwiches or something or grilled cheese. It was something about a sandwiches. And I sat there and I was like, I've never seen Paul McCartney that excited about food. And he was telling this story about it. And I'm like, do you imagine if we capture those moments with musicians? And, yeah, uh, we did. So today I'm going to be playing one with a Canadian <laughs> icon, but not Tom Petty. Like, oh, I can't <laughs> believe you met all those people. You're incredible. That's incredible. That, that, so was there was there one moment out of all those musicians that you met that you're just you always remember that was the most incredible moment? Yes, it was when it was when I was in Vail, which I didn't know where that was until I got on a plane, okay. and I was. It was between Christmas and New Year, and I was the only person not wearing fur. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, I got, and I didn't know who this rock star I was going to meet and stay in his guest house and have dinner with him and his wife. And I didn't know who he was. They just told me he was called Glenn. And when I got there, we were up to about day three. We're having a great time. And he says to me, you don't know who I am, do you, Linda? I said, no, Glenn. They told me you wrote the theme music to Miami Vice. <laughs> and that's all I know. And he goes, did you ever hear of the Eagles? And I'm like, yeah, but they weren't very big in England. <laughs> oh. said, Glenn Fry. <laughs> I was going to say. Oh. <laughs> the defining moment was when he, and we just got on and laughed and it was great. Was when it was between Christmas and New Year. And I, I used to be a really big New Year's Eve par party person. Yeah. yeah. And I said, Glenn, what are you doing for New Year's Eve? Have you planned something exciting? And he goes, Linda, my whole life has been New Year's Eve. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, of course. <laughs> no, well, yeah. It's... I'm to the Eagles. <laughs> Eagles. I, I'm blown away. So many wow. things. So wow. many fun things. <laughs> well, well, thank you for spending this few minutes with us and to be able to share. No, like, we'll talk about food in a second and about menus, but... I'm blown away. I did not know that. You should tell that. You should tell those. You should write a book about it. I maybe one day. Whenever you should. I, I'm never gonna retire. Maybe one day. <laughs> you know what? I, I saw this show. It was um it was uh it had Clinton Clint Eastwood and um the gentleman just has stomach cancer, the musicians, the, the country guy. And oh, okay. um I forget his name right now. It's I'm drawing a blank. Anyways. He 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 asked Clint Eastwood like you know, eighty eight years old. He told him he was going to start to produce another movie, and he goes like like Clint, what's your secret to keeping young? And he says, I don't let the old man in. Right, Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I love that line. Right, <laughs> so I'm with you. I I, I don't somebody, think I'll ever grow up. Somebody messaged me the other day who is older than I am and said, "How are you? By the way, how's 2024?" And, and how are you feeling about, you know, old age creeping in? And I said, I'm too busy to get old. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think about it at all. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm too busy as well for that. Yeah. Well, well, we won't take much of your time. I do want to ask you some questions and stuff around this show Absolutely. that we're going to release. And first of all, like, I'm all, I get excited. Like, I've had a couple of people on the show. I don't know if you ever heard the show that we did with, um, chef in uh, California, you, you know, her, um, Oh, uh, Franklin, Franklin. Yeah. Uh, right. She was telling us about how she cooked, um, a cake for Muhammad Ali. And I was sitting there and I'm like, I can't believe I'm having a conversation with someone that was able to hang out with Muhammad Ali. So yeah. this is kind of like that moment, just so you know, right. you hung out with Tom Petty. You know, Glenn Frank. I was invited as a guest to Louisville in Kentucky the two weeks before Christmas, and I've never been to Kentucky okay. and it, to watch them make bourbon and drink it. But this is the home of Muhammad Ali. There's there's like a whole Muhammad Ali museum there in Louisville and streets named after him, and he's like their favorite son, other than other than a few film stars. Oh, yeah. Um, like George Clooney, Tom Cruise, and Johnny Depp, who also come from Kentucky and they're very, very proud of. <laughs> and the Disco Ball Factory. That's what they're proud of in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> the Corvette Factory, sorry. I love it. 
and bourbon. But yeah, Muhammad Ali, I knew not much. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know that. Kentucky, and then I found out a lot. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I'm trying to keep on track here, Jay. Yes, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. I'm not you. You keep telling me amazing stories about musicians <laughs> and celebrities. I'm blown away. Um, like Tom Petty. I was just listening to Tom Petty the other day going, man, we miss him. We miss his music, his creativity in the music and everything that he did. Absolutely. I was th- like, I think that every time I hear his song. I remember, I remember where I was when I heard. I was in the uh, cab just leaving the airport in Toronto. I, re- I literally remember the corner when I heard it on the radio. I, could, I, I thought I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was like, what? No, it's yeah. kind of like a joke. Like, I thought it was a musician playing, like, you know, bad joke. But I, I just couldn't figure it out until uh, people were texting me. I'm like, well, no way. It's an incredible loss. So, I know. Anyways, Old enough. Uh, it was just like, because there's no one that replaces that. No. Like, you don't see people replacing those icon musicians coming you know like you just in no disrespect to me people that are creating music i think are incredible today but they don't have that legacy in a sense and i think i remember when i was doing art when i was selling paintings and stuff and people were like why aren't they buying your paintings and my art dealer at the time was putting like three you know two to three thousand dollars in a painting she was trying to make money at it in calgary by the way and and she was, she was there were like the reviews were good and everything else, but I didn't have a legacy. I didn't have that legacy that came with the artwork or, you know, the, the, the struggle or the story behind it. I was straight out of university and no, no one, no one knew who I was or, well, that's a really big story behind that. He came from university and got same as an art dealer. Right. So it really wasn't anything there. So they weren't, they wouldn't sell people are looking on they're gorgeous, but there's no story. And I find the music that we have today, the stories behind them maybe is not as interesting or I don't know what the word is, but just yeah. not like we've heard in the past, like Tom Petty. Like I, I remember watching a movie about him and just a few of them and how he started, you know, they lived in a van, you know, all these different stories you hear all the time from a lot of these rock stars that are legends. And I don't know if it's like that anymore because <laughs> you can produce it off your computer on a weekend isn't it yeah they don't you don't have to go through hardship to create art no. music or art or anything whereas one is you know in the old days <laughs> the struggle was it was also yeah, the struggle yeah yeah but wasn't it you know yeah. to go through the times the hard times although i must admit i have a friend here matt blaze and when i talk to him he's a, a singer i met him when he was 18 mm-hmm. and he's probably 30 something you know and he's well known in calgary and and he it is still a struggle i suppose you know for yeah. his music yeah it's, it's probably a different struggle you know it's probably more but the, there's such a huge amount of content being created today when it comes to music or you know whatever shows or whoever so yeah. i'm sure it's like that and i know the digital world is not fun i've heard from musicians it's it's very challenging so i'm sure it's a, it's just a different challenge but um, yeah, we miss those legends. I tell you, I tell you, it just yeah, hits me hard. Yeah. So I got to talk to you about menus. Now that we get into this, after I find out you're even like <laughs> just you're a legend yourself, like it's crazy. <laughs> so you write a lot about restaurants, yes. right? You write a lot about restaurants and, and I really want your take on, and we hear this a lot and I have heard it like truckloads all the way up to like, even today, I heard it again about the demand for new products on a menu people are looking for new items and i'd like to take i thought you know no one better than linda to tell tell our industry how important it is from your perspective because i'm sure you go out a lot you see a lot of different things why is it important that restaurants have new items on menus well i think and the interesting thing is there's two sides to this of course oh, there's okay, good. consumers <laughs> do it there's our side to it yeah and then there's the restaurant side to it as well. And I actually took the opportunity to speak to a few restaurants, knowing that we were going to be talking. Okay, did you? I did, because I wanted to know about new menu items from their side. So, I mean, for us, I, it's very important. Um, if we, you know, there's somewhere we go quite often, and then we 
pretty much know that menu inside out. We can It can get a bit stagnant, can't it? But we still want to support them. And so we're always looking for something new and exciting. Um, you know, everybody loves the go-to items. Mm-hmm. But they also want to try something new. So, uh, and it was very interesting because I was chatting to uh, a lady who's just taken over a very well-known Thai restaurant that the owner had retired from. Mm-hmm. And she was the chef and now she's the owner and she's taken it over. And in the process of doing that, she sort of modernized it. And the menu had 240 items on it. (laughs) And she's like, there's no way I can possibly offer all of that. So she's cut it down to 54 really good menu items. And now the customers are coming in and they're saying, yes, but but I only came because I wanted that dish that was on the old menu. And she's saying, that's okay. I was the chef. I can make it for you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and I'll make it for you. But it's interesting. And there's only so many items you can have realistically on a menu. Otherwise, people think, yeah. well, you can have all of these things and probably none of them are very good. If yeah. I have a small menu, I think it's all going to be good. Yeah. You know, there's restaurants I go to that I love. And if my favorite dish isn't there on the menu, I'm like, distraught. <laughs> <laughs> But I always, always want to be trying new dishes. I I really do. Um, So it is important. It is important for the guests, the customers, to keep things fresh, keep adding Mm -hmm. things. Um, Whether that's just seasonally, you know, because now there's different produce in season uh, coming into spring than there was in the depth of winter. Um, So that's an opportunity to change them. Um, But from the restaurant's point of view, and this was so interesting. Mm. Um, you know, talking to three or four different restaurant owners, um, one of them, for instance, uh, can I mention names or, or not? Yeah, absolutely. So talking to Patrick Hill at the living room. So they started in 2010, you know, so, uh, sorry, 2000. So they've got yeah. history behind them. And he was saying that to him, consistency is more important than new because they're very well established. So they don't want to sort of rock the boat. But the struggle is with the chefs, because by nature, chefs are creative people. And they they need an outlet for the creativity. And so what they do is they have to do special features and events along certain themes, so that not only does it bring them the customers, but also it gives the chefs opportunity to get creative and experiment. Um, they can explore new products, mm-hmm. new combinations, new ways of cooking and preparing, yeah. which is important for a chef. Otherwise, they feel they're stagnating. So it's actually pretty important from the restaurant point of view to yeah. introduce new. You know, they need a challenge. Um, staff morale, you know, the servers, it's just same old, same old. You know, it's it's easy for them. But don't most people like a bit of a challenge, I think, as well. Um do you find more restaurants like back in the day we used to look at court, like uh, every season you would change your menu. Yes. Now I'm hearing more and more restaurants. I'm actually hearing a lot, even in Calgary, um, changing their menus almost monthly. Do you think well, that's too much or do you think that's the new world that we're in? It's so interesting. Um, there's probably a number of reasons for this, mostly probably because not many restaurants want to keep any inventory. Um, therefore, if you're buying things put by the day, the week, and you don't want to keep inventory, then you're going to have to get creative with what to do with them. Um, but there is a downside as well, because if you're bringing out a new dish and you've got all those ingredients and you're making it and people don't like it or it doesn't sell, it doesn't capture the imaginations, what are you going to do with all those ingredients? Because <laughs> you might have brought them in specially. Um, but it's it's it is such an interesting thing. Um, we've got restaurants here that are literally changing the menus every week. We have a new one open, Salt and Brick, that their whole philosophy is we're changing our menu every week. Yeah. Some of the items stay. There's three or four items that they just can't take off. They'd be a mutiny. But <laughs> introducing these new items. And the raw bar, one of the chefs does a raw bar every week day that menu changes i know but but that we can understand because he is literally buying fresh fish every day and it's not being kept 
today. So, I mean, that's a little bit different. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, as I say, both sides of it, really. Chefs want to improve. They want to be challenged. So they want to keep creating. Um, who was it that said, well, it was Stephen Deer from Modern Steak who said to me, um, you know, it's it's like a, it feels like a, lo- a movie every restaurant launch, she said. It's, it's the excitement, it's the nervousness, it, it's everything of, you know, impossible failure, the risk, the reward, hopefully success. Yeah. Um, but he says, you know, what they have to think about is who are they doing it for? Is it for the guest? Is it for the restaurant concept mm-hmm. or is it for their egos? And that's a good point, you know. Is it the quality and and extending the brand or is it just hype? And these are very interesting questions that they raised. Um, But as they said, if if somebody comes in that maybe doesn't know the restaurant so well and it's a new menu item, they've actually created a regular. They've got a regular customer. Oh, that's cool. For them, it's very, very important. But I think for the customers too, as I say, there's an excitement not knowing what's going to be on the menu this week isn't there? Do you think with the generation that a lot of restaurants are attracting now, this younger generation, um, are more adapted to that? Like they're more expecting that nowadays? I would definitely say so, yes. I mean, yeah, there are restaurants who've been going 37 years here and may never have changed the menu. And mm-hmm. people because of that. Yeah. But maybe that's the grandparents of the people who they really need to be attracting because that generation is getting older and yes you do need to attract the younger people um you know younger people may not be dining out so much they may be meeting socially and yep. snacking and drinking but maybe not um the full meal deal you know at restaurants so yep. you do have to capture their imagination it doesn't make a very interesting instagram mm-hmm. if it's the same dish over and over again either <laughs> That's absolutely true. <laughs> how big how big do you see this? And we hear this nonstop. The customer experience right now is is we're hearing this from a lot of companies out there saying that it's all about the customer experience right now. And that would tie into this new menus and changing the menu all the time. How important is that to operators right now to be giving customers that experience that is over the top? It's pretty important it's also really hard <laughs> to get okay. and really expensive um but the customer wants the experience they want something not, you know more than just a mm. dual meal sort of thing or even a birthday celebration meal they want everything else that goes along with that um i run events i run anywhere between five and 15 food and wine pairing dinners a month in restaurants wow. which wow. is magazine came from and I've been doing it since 2005 it's an event you're going to get a six course meal with six different wines and you're going to hear about why they pair so well and where the wines came from and the people and the places I don't talk about barrels and soil and all that boring stuff and people love it because they're intelligent and they want to learn they want to understand a little more Mm -hmm. they want something new they want you know I did one last week and it was all boutique wineries and one lady said there isn't a wine on here that I've heard of and I good what's how <laughs> boring me me pouring you something that you've already know the, yeah. the idea is that you're going to experience something new and at the events the shit gives the chefs opportunity to try new dishes because they don't have to be menu dishes and that's what the restaurants love because they love that creativity they love the mm. opportunity but putting it on a menu and having it stay on a menu for maybe three months or six months can be very, very challenging. A lot goes into developing the new menus, time and money, you know. And it if, does. if it doesn't take off, you know, that's really bad news for the rest. Do you find a lot of chefs don't change the menu because of that reason? Like it cost a lot to look at R&D for their menus? I think so, yes, particularly the smaller ones. Yeah. Uh, Very much so, yes. Very hard. Uh, You know, and and other other restaurants are, you know, they have a brand image, don't they? And they have to stay within that image. They can't suddenly go and do something completely outrageous, although maybe it would be very fun if they did. (laughs) (laughs) Particularly the customers. And I think what we're seeing now is a lot of pop-ups in Calgary. Okay. 
Um, this is also interesting because it's allowing chefs, even the chefs that are working are actually doing pop-ups at night in other places and they're collaborating. In Calgary, yeah. this is the reasons why I love this city. Chefs do not compete, they collaborate. Yeah. And I absolutely love that. And we're seeing it so often now that chefs from two different restaurants will get together and do a pop-up because it allows them both to do something they're not doing every day, day in, day out. But the customers love it because they get to see more of what those chefs are capable of outside their own restaurant. So it's really quite a fascinating thing. Do you, is there a lot of chefs doing residencies in restaurants right now in Calgary? Doing residencies, yeah, as opposed to being full time employed. Yeah, yeah. Are, are they? Are you hearing that at all in Calgary? Not so much. No. Okay. Um, I just heard it. Why I just said because in New York, I was just doing an interview the other day with a chef that's from New York, and he says this is huge right now, just because a lot of chefs cannot afford to do pop ups because of the cost of the rent of the facility and the location yeah. that they're actually going in and doing residencies at different restaurants for a time period kind of interesting it is and it doesn't really happen very much here but there's a shortage of experienced chefs really come by here (laughs) yes there's no chefs to draw on people um it's hard restaurants are constantly looking there's always a need for chefs so um probably that isn't maybe like new york of course is fast moving Mm -hmm. pace and people are probably always moving around where yeah, not quite so much, you know. Well, I think Calgary is also still affordable in a way to open a restaurant compared to probably New York and stuff. I think so. Uh, I'm assuming. But um, anyways, I would just want to thank you so much, Linda, oh, for absolutely. blowing my mind earlier, um, but also your insights into why it's important for restaurants to really continuously updating their menu and putting new items on there. Um, absolutely. On both sides of it, for themselves and for the guests. I, it, I love it really important well thank you so much for that insight there you go folks what you didn't know you got it from linda she tells you um thanks again linda and to everyone else please continue to listen to our shows we got amazing stuff like this so thanks so much linda wonderful thanks very much jay thanks